Welcome back on the AM show. Thank you for staying. And I must say that it is quite an honor and privilege to be breathing the same air and be on the same platform with the man I'm about to introduce to you. You will understand why I say that, but he has a book out uh, that will soon be launched. He'll be giving us details, critical and biographical essays. I'm sure when I turn it, you will see, oh yes, there it is. And now I'm sure you understand why I say I am in rarefied territory. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you Nana Dr. SKB Asante, Paramount Chief as well of Asante Asokori. I, 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 I goofed earlier when I said Asokori Mampo. Asante Asokori. Thank you so much, Nana, for joining the conversation. You're welcome. <clears throat> so we're going to be talking about, we're going to unearth what this book is all about. And you should grab a copy. Over 700 pages of history of everything that you can imagine. Economics, law, and a life well lived. If you don't grab a copy of this book, you'd be missing out big time. And for me, I would proffer it to all our current leaders. I think there's a plethora of knowledge they could acquire from this book. But let's get into it with Nana himself. From... A young boy in the Asokori area who maybe never dreamed that you would attain the dizzying heights you have. What was it like growing up? Well, we lived in the very rural setting. Um, uh, there was no electricity. There was no pipe-borne water. We walked barefooted to school. Um, but we had uh, very dedicated teachers. And one of them, J.S. Cover, I must mention, the headmaster, who urged me to sit the entrance exam to Achimota. Uh, there was no common entrance exam in those days, so somebody had to literally uh, hold your hands and go and take this exam. <clears throat> there were only 12 secondary schools. Uh, <clears throat> we had um, a very far-sighted paramount chief, Nanaya Ojima, uh, the first, and the Methodist Church collaborated in building the Asakura Methodist School, which was the only senior school in the whole area. People came from Jabbing, New Jersey, people like uh, the late Professor Dubuahin, who was my classmate at the elementary school. So that was a battleground. <clears throat> we didn't have much in the way of uh, amenities, but it was a very clean community, very hardworking. We had dedicated teachers. This is how were able to progress from Asakori to Achimota and beyond. Mm. And speaking of <laughs> which, obviously there were people who impacted you in terms of, because I, I remember reading the book and looking at where, when in class you, people were asked, what do you want to be? And you said you were going to be a lawyer. There was a sh an acute paucity of lawyers. I mean, it was almost unthinkable for you with your economic situation and everything in some uh, backwards to, to think you could yes. even become a lawyer. So who are those who encouraged you on this journey? Well, I must say that that, that was an answer that I gave to uh, the late Day Annan, who was an inspector of schools. Day Annan became a very distinguished uh, public servant and uh, resident in Kruma. He was an inspector of schools. And when he came and observed us, he um, said, little boy, what would you like to do? And just to impress him, I said, I wanted to be a lawyer. And everybody laughed. It was a uh, dismissive laughter, uh, because in those days, um, there were hardly any lawyers in uh, Ashanti. I think you could think of uh, um, Asafoje and maybe one or uh, two others. And uh, <clears throat> law was not easily uh, uh, accessible uh, as a, a subject. Uh, yeah, there was no law school in Ghana, there was no legal, in fact, there was no university at the time that I was speaking. Only affluent people were able to send their yeah. awards. So to say that you wanted to be a lawyer was a little fanciful. <laughs> but <clears throat> the interesting thing is that in the course of my growing up, in my secondary and tertiary education, there were many changes in Ghana. And I always say that um, I left uh, um, uh, Asakori in 1946 to go to Achimota School. And by the time I did my sixth form in 1952, there was an African 
prime minister. Yeah. So, so th these were the changes that were encompassed in my training. By the time I got my degree, 1956, we were about to have full independence. So we went through phenomenal changes. And uh, things that are taken for granted at this time were not so taken for granted. Mm. Uh, the challenges which we, um, we embraced, right. and that's how we got as far as we did. Yeah. Yours is one story of definite tenacity. You, you yeah. had to really rein yourself in to achieve those heights. But when you did get to read law, and then things started following from there. I remember reading as well how you at um, one of these organizations, the United Nations, yes. where you actually were head of one of those institutions. Someone met you and was wondering, a, a black person, so to speak, from Africa, heading yes. this team and being in South Korea and others, it was of interest. What did it mean to you then, having followed through, been able to follow through, through inspiration, through God's work, and attaining those heights? What did it mean to you then? Well, it's a very humbling experience. Of course, in the international community, people wonder. For example, I was the first uh, person to be appointed an attorney in the legal department of the World Bank right. in 1966. And so people wonder, well, um, how can he do it? Uh, but if you establish your competence, you get respected. So I've always seen that, you know, one should not accept limitations, uh, one should embrace challenges, and these sort of create a goodwill, because after I joined the World Bank, we had a, a number of well, uh, distinguished World Bank uh, lawyers from uh, Ghana, including the late uh, Party of Osama, who became even Vice President of the World Bank and Secretary of the Bank. So that's how one creates a way <clears throat> and, um, so basically, you paved the way. Well, humbly, in certain uh, there were others who paved the way for me too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Spe speaking of which, you worked with all of these entities, but then you also got into the political fray in Ghana, so to speak. You were Solicitor General and Abuzia and all of that. What, what, what made you want to do this? You, you were at a yes. point Deputy Attorney General. Correct. You were Solicitor General and yes. Abuzia. Tell us about that period and politics in Ghana. All right. Um, it reminds me of uh, one of my colleagues at the World Bank. I was an attorney there in 1966, and then in 69, I was appointed Solicitor General under the Second Republican Constitution by Prime Minister Abuzia. And this Argentinian friend of mine, uh, Dennis, uh, Daniel Lacuona, said, why are you leaving a secure permanent position uh, in the World Bank to go to unstable Africa, as he called it? So I said, oh, it gives me an opportunity to be of service. So we were trained in those days to look upon our surgeon abroad as a temporary one. You went, mm -hmm. you studied, if you worked, eventually you came back to your country to help. So when the opportunity came, I said, well, this is a contribution I could make in the legal sector, not a politician, but as a senior uh, uh, government lawyer. Uh, but when I came, within two years and three months, there was a coup. So that, that was my baptism into... It put pain to, 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 to <laughs> yeah, all of your ambitions. That's right. did, did you feel that, uh, aggrieved that you had, you had risked it to come to your country to serve? Well, so Contrary to what advice you had been given, that look, you're risking leaving something permanent, stable. Oh, I, I, I certainly was concerned, particularly when the champion came. Uh, my position was very uncertain, was very insecure, and he um, looked upon me as a Buzi appointee, which is correct, even though I was a civil servant. And so it was an uneasy period. Uh, but technical um, uh, experience helped me to survive. Uh, that was the time that we were doing negotiations uh, uh, for the <clears throat> long-term settlement of our external debt. That was the time that we acquired 55% uh, equity interest in Ashanti Goldfield and Cast. That was the time that we negotiated financing for the Kong project. Uh, that was the time that we negotiated the acquisition of Ajip, which became Goyle. So 
with all these uncertainties, I was able to contribute on the technical side to a number of important landmarks. Mm. That's how I saw it. But eventually, the atmosphere was not conducive. Right. And um, <clears throat> eventually, uh, I left and went back to international service to the United Nations. Yeah. Mm. So, yes, uh, and for those who want all the nitty-gritty, you would have to necessarily grab a copy of this book because, look, 700-plus pages, we can't exhaust it in these uh, 15 minutes or so we've been granted, and it's not even going to suffice to do any dignity to the book. But you should grab a copy. I'll let you know how you can do that shortly at the launch. But I also want us to get into the 1992 Constitution. Yes. which in recent times has come into lots of questions. People have said three decades on, it has lost some of its flavor reflecting the aspirations, ambitions of the people of Ghana. But you were chair of that team, that uh, committee of experts set up in 1991. What was that experience like? Because at a point, even is it the Ghana Bar Association, they booed you That's for, correct. for partaking that, in this endeavor. That is very correct. First of all, we must distinguish three stages in the... Um, between three stages in the evolution of the Constitution. There was first the um, <clears throat> survey of the country's uh, preferences uh, for the structure of the political system they wanted. Th this was done under the late uh, Justice Dan Annan, mm. as he produced the national um, uh, NCD report. Uh, so that was the one which established uh, a popular preference for multi-party system of government. After that, a committee was set up called the Committee of Experts, which I chaired, to formulate proposals for <clears throat> the drafting of the Constitution of Ghana. It was not the final thing, it was to formulate proposals. The, <clears throat> we did that, and it, it was a very um, uncongenial environment. People suspected the whole um, intention Enterprise. of the constitutional transition mm. exercise mm. and who were seen as collaborators in some way. Uh, but I was uh, known by the um, United Nations to assist in this uh, constitutional transition project. But my mind was clear that <clears throat> this eventually will set us up on a constitutional path. And so I persisted despite all the hostility uh, from the bar and from the members of the consultative assembly. Uh, both sides were, were not too happy about us. We were supposed to participate in the actual draft of the consultative by being members of the uh, consultative assembly. They said, no, you finish your work, go. And so uh, some of our proposals were rejected. Right. You know, like uh, a widened uh, uh, council of state, uh, like a proportional representation, mm. uh, like having uh, <clears throat> the uh, equivalent of a chief executive in the district assembly elected by district assembly members, admittedly, but not the whole, uh, the involvement of chiefs in local government, uh, a number of things. Uh, the um, system of having a prime minister and a president, a president in order to diffuse concentration of powers in one, uh, in one hand, mm. all these were rejected. Wow. So, so your we, proposal initially yes, was for us to have a system yes. a la what uh, you know, happens in the UK, for example. Yeah. Uh, yes. Well, the UK, they, um, they, they don't have a uh, prime minister and an executive president. At least not, not them, but not other not systems. Other systems do. Uh, so um, and the reasons were, that first of all, diffusion concentration. And the other was uh, division of labor, you know, mm. sometimes. A person who has a clout to win pre the president is not necessarily the best person to coordinate and administer right. at the executive level. This was to allow that. They rejected that. So, um, so that when people talk about uh, reviewing the constitution, I say sometimes, I say, why don't you even consider some of the things which we proposed and see whether they were properly rejected or not? But I agree that any document which has survived for 30 years, right. in the light of our experience, uh, should be reviewed. Needs some tweaking. Needs uh, some in, in recent times, former President Kufour said, for example, that the Council of State, there should be a second chamber, for example. Do, well, do you agree with him quickly yeah. on that? Oh, yeah. Well, what we suggested 
and in the form of expanding the Council of uh, State, uh, having a non-partisan membership and so forth, was very much like uh, the Second Chamber. We didn't say Second Chamber because the, under the Kuzi, from the Kuzi Constitution time, people have always been wary of a Second Chamber, the citizens' principle. But we tried to sort of create the semblance of that in our proposal of the Council of State, which of course was also rejected by the, um, by the Consultative Assembly. Mm. So, but I agree with him. I agree with him that the Second Chamber would be desirable, representing not only cheese, but you know, experts and professionals and various uh, stakeholders and um, <clears throat> civil service organizations. Yes, most mm. certainly. You have been a Paramount Chief for decades. <laughs> Taking up that you know, role, what did it mean for you? What has it meant for you? What does it mean for you now? And the Chieftaincy Institution in Ghana, and some what people say about it, some say it's anachronistic, some say it has outlived its usefulness, others have different opinions. What do you make of it? And look, in the fight against Galamse and others, the traditional rulers have been drawn in. What do you make of the chieftaincy institution? How can we harness it as a people to get even more? Well, in this book, right. I wrote, um, I delivered a lecture at the Ghana Academy of Arts and Sciences called The Musings of a Chief in Contemporary Ghana. It was really my reflections of chieftaincy and my experience. <clears throat> and I ended by recommending some sort of integration between our modern forms and our traditional system. The thing really is this, that if you look at chieftaincy and the way it is fed, <clears throat> it has been very resilient. Uh, during the nationalist struggle, the intelligentsia were very much uh, opposed to chieftaincy because they thought chieftaincy was not democratic enough. We didn't have the more intelligent people. They should not be wielded in power. This was when <clears throat> there was a system of um, uh, indirect uh, rule. Now, there was some validity to that. But now, chieftaincy, you know, the power has gone to the people. Uh, but chieftaincy still remains valid because I have realized through my experience that the machinery of government is very limited. If you go to the rural area, uh, the administration of justice, the maintenance of peace, the mobilization of people for peace, uh, for development, these are mainly done by chiefs. Now, when we go to a national house of chiefs or regional house of chiefs, there's always a minister of state appealing to chiefs to help them to do this, to stop Galamse, uh, to stop um, uh, 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 cutting of trees, to help them to uh, achieve governmental goals. However, when it comes to local government, for example, chiefs are not represented. Right. And there really is no reason why chiefs are not represented. Chiefs are excluded from parliament, but I maintain that any group of people should not be excluded from the legislative process. So either you have them in the second, first chamber or in the second chamber. Anybody should be able to comment on legislation appearing before parliament. And the idea that chiefs should not participate because this is a, a, a party political thing uh, is not valid in my view. Mm. So, <clears throat> if chiefs do have a role in development, if they have to be called upon from time to time to assist in doing this, then why is it that we don't find a way of integrating them in the system? Right. Let's take Galamse. Galamse, <clears throat> chiefs are excluded from the process of granting mining leases right. or mining licenses. licenses. Right. They yeah, are uh, excluded from uh, participating in the uh, assembly. They are excluded from parliament. They don't have executive power. According to the Supreme Court ruling, chiefs don't really have judicial power. So if somebody is really doing something wrong, what is the, you know... Chiefs are limited. The, 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 the chiefs are limited. What is the mechanism by which the chiefs actually stop somebody? It has been held by the Supreme Court 
that the old rule which said that uh, failure to obey a chief's uh, order uh, is a criminal thing, that's a violation of the Constitution, you know. So you can't have, you can't eat your cake and have it, as people would say. You can't eat your cake and have it. <laughs> right before we, we, yeah. we, we just wrap with the conversation yeah. on the book, I, I would be remiss not to do this. You've, you've taught in the legal spectrum for a long time. Yes. I'd just like to find out from you, when you look at legal education in Ghana now and all the brouhaha about the Ghana School of Law and all of that, what do you make of it? Should we be expanding? Should we be gatekeeping like we're supposedly doing? In, in some 30 seconds, what's your take on that? Well, first of all, let's think of the substance of legal education. Yeah. And I think that there are things are being done as much as possible, but there are two things which are missing. My experience of customary law, both in my studies and in my um, role as a chief, teaches me that customary law as a subject should be taught. You know, when I was um, doing my master's degree, uh, I did jurisprudence, international law and other, but I also did comparative customary law. It's not taught in the law schools. It should be taught. I mean, it's made an adjunct, a little adjunct to you know, family law or land law, but customer law should be taught because that's when you understand society. The second thing is that there are many areas which are developing, and I think some start has been made. You know, I am very interested in international business transactions and negotiations and so forth. These are very complex areas. You don't get them from the ordinary curriculum, either for uh, the LLB, or, uh, some aspects, maybe petroleum for the LLM, but you don't get the whole picture. Most of our negotiations are affected by lack of expertise in the particular areas. And I think the universities could establish specialist areas where they are dealing with you know, financial um, agree financing agreements, uh, joint ventures, uh, petroleum agreements, and so forth and so forth. They do a little bit of petroleum agreement. So that is one area. The, the, the law is always growing. Yeah. We have an, uh, an interdependent um, economy, and we should know how to deal uh, with each other, either with multinational corporations or with governments or with uh, other foreign entities. Mm. Yeah. So, uh, like now, you said, the we, other, we, the we other had one. our law school, Rwanda, yeah, yeah. others, the Kenyas yeah, have yeah. come to yes. expand. We have yeah. still remained where we are. Yes. Just, just very briefly, I want us to wrap with uh, the, the, the talk of the book and the launch date on that. All right. You want me to do that? Uh, sorry. So, the, the school of law as it has remained. Uh -huh. Oh, the school law. Oh, yeah. Well, I have, um, I think. The General Legal Council is quite right in insisting upon certain standards. And that before you are admitted to, to legal practice, there are certain requirements that you must sit. And I, I believe that the university uh, should be aware of that in teaching. Now, having prescribed what should be the requirement for admission and having allowed the university to teach, <coughs> to the LLB level, if anybody wants to become a lawyer, we should not restrict how it gets through the training or the um, uh, coach professional side to get to the final. The examination should be there. If you can do it by some way other than going to the law school, it should be done. In the UK, people can sit at home, exactly. prepare, yes, yes. and go and sit there. Oh, yeah, that's what we experience. We, so we should be see, able to get that. We should be able to get that. Or right. you can have schools, you know, special private schools, preparing yeah. people for that. Right. If they pass, they pass. Okay. Let's wrap with the book. Now, tomorrow is the big day. It's that the launch correct. of this, yes. this wonderful book. Yeah. Uh, if I may, what triggered this? Why put this together in the first place? Uh, well, over the years... Uh, I've made several attempts, sometimes to write a biographies. Um, but I also have given a number of lectures around the world, uh, both in Ghana and elsewhere. And you know, you give a lecture and then later on you go and see and the lecture is lying there, but it's very pertinent 
to the issues of today. So I have a combination which, are <coughs> which comprises biographical uh, materials. Uh, so my education, and um, there's quite a lot on Achimota, for example. Yes. Uh, uh, that would be interesting to Akuras. Um, but I also deal with major issues like the evolution of the 1992 Constitution, mm. uh, like the history of uh, legal education in Ghana, uh, a history of uh, the law faculty and now the School mm. of Law. Mm. I deal with chieftaincy. I deal with the, my international experience, what happened when I was in the World Bank, mm. the kind of things that the United Nations did not only for developing countries, including China and so forth. So, so this is a repository of all of oh, that yes. knowledge of the, put together right. yes. in here. And, and you had to do this. Yes. And then I also, have, there's a section on tributes. Right. You know, some mostly Ghanaians, but one, um, about three Americans mm. that I knew, which is interesting because it shows my interaction to them, my appreciation of them. So that's an unusual thing to have. <laughs> in the book about yeah. So this wonderful book is up for the launch tomorrow. What's the venue? Which guests are coming? Before the numbers to call yes. are on your screens. Um, the um, venue is the Ghana Ac the Academy, Academy of, of Arts, Arts and Sciences, Sciences the auditorium. Right. Um, uh, the guests are His Excellency the Vice President, okay. uh, the Honorable Chief Justice. Okay. Uh, the yes, the chair, uh, yes, uh, yeah. the <clears throat> chairman is uh, Honorable Justice Stephen Alan Robe. Okay. The M MC is Kafu Day. Okay. And the reviewer my is my own big brother. <laughs> yes, the reviewer is uh, Professor Kofi Abochi, okay. who is the uh, dean of the you law school of the uh, University of Professional Studies. Okay. And uh, a Santihan's representative over there. A Santihanist representative, or the Toon Force representative. Uh, so after the <coughs> launch, the books will be made available in various uh, workshop, which workshops, are, right. which our publisher will indicate okay. uh, over there. So they are available. Yeah. All right. So in some 30 seconds, this is how we conclude the conversation. You have lived some 90 years, or 90 odd years of, <laughs> of acquired some 90 odd years of wisdom. What sage words would you leave us with on the show, especially in these trying times for the young people, for the older people, for leaders? What are your final words to us? Well, the book is, has a subtitle, From an African Village to, to the, the Global, global village, village and, and back. back. The object of that... Um, but it's a show that one should not accept limitations. Um, one should not say that, well, I'm uh, deprived, uh, I'm deprivileged, uh, I come from a village and my father was not so and so and so. It's a declaration of hope. Right. Uh -huh. So, and you talk of my age, I didn't do this in one, uh, uh, these achievements that you mentioned were not achieved in, in a day or in a few months. My other question is that young people should work hard right. for what they want to achieve. The right. idea of easy access to wealth, which is now predominant, is something which I uh, would discourage. Uh, in the long run, you may not be rich, but here we are. You know, you're entertaining me to this program, and you are calling on people to buy this book, not by virtue of my wealth, but by virtue of the hard work, and of course, uh, the grace and mercy of the Almighty, which I've always relied upon. Uh, so this is my, 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 my advice. Let's stick to the sterling value. And um, with God's help, work hard, and you will achieve something. You make an impact that will make you feel proud, proud, and not necessarily acquire lots of money and things like right. that. Thank you very right. much. Thank you so much. You, yeah. you just remind me uh, of Busumu Kofi Annan. May his soul rest in peace. Yes. When you know his wealth figures came out there, but if you look at his clout and you look at what, it's not about the money. 
It's about what you do with your life. Yes, Thank I, you so much. I, I, I feature him in the book. Yes. Uh -huh. yes. <laughs> and he was a very modest man. Yes. Even at the pinnacle of his power, he never turned down my telephone calls. He always returned wherever he was, sure. however busy he was. Wow. And you know, he wasn't pretentious. He was so modest um, and um, humble. He's a man that I admired, admired a lot. A man most of us aspire to. Nana, thank you so much You're for welcome. having joined us uh, today. Yes. Just stay with us as we transition to the next conversation. But of course, this book being launched tomorrow, it speaks about Nana Dr. SKB Asante, Paramount Chief of Asante Asokori. You don't want to miss a copy of this. But up next, we are going on social media and also taking your calls on the Black Stars as they face off with the South Koreans. What are your expectations? What are your predictions? What do you think we should do? Should Barbara Man play today? Should Barbara Man play today? Should Jordan Ayu play today? Answer those questions right after the break.